then I will roll into the thing that the XF or FS tests, sorry. Um, the, so Ted, I know you do this and I do it too. We have our own homegrown setups for running FS tests and ButterFS has FS tests that run and then we collate all the information. We have a website that shows you what failed and what configuration and all of that stuff. Like that has been huge and that's been running for a year. Lewis's approach is to run the thing a thousand times in a row to see if anything fails. My approach is to run it once <laughs> and then I get a good, after about a year or a few months, I've got a good list of what is flaky and what isn't. And I've gone back and fixed up the flakiness and fixed up those things. These are two different models, but I think they're both pretty valid, right? And to your point earlier, Ted, about like best bang for your buck, for me, my, this has been the best bang for my buck because I'm not going to run a test a thousand times unless I notice there's a problem, right? I mean, um, I think one of the other things which I've certainly learned at this point is I trust XFS tests way more than I trust, you know, Linux next testing yep. because I, I find the problems in XFS tests. I don't find them in Linux next soaking. Um, and it's also the case that there are a lot of tests where, you know, there's a flake percentage of 15%. In reality, I don't see users complaining about that bug when I finally get it fixed. It's just XFS test is way more nitpicky than the vast majority of the user base or even our most stressful production workloads at work. Right. Um, and so that is probably one of the reasons why I don't stress when I have tests that, you know, there's a 15% flake, flake percentage because I just know I can't fix them all. I would love to fix them all. I don't have enough hours in the day or, you know, engineers on my team to get to all of them. Yep. And, you know, that is an uncomfortable truth and it's also something which uh, is hard to get across to new people who are actually trying to, uh, you know, get started with testing. Uh, one of the things I've actually been strongly thinking about is I have these exclude files that sort of explain all the different tests, why I exclude them, why they fail. Some of them are XFS test bugs. Some of them are just, we flake on this 15% of the time. Um, and I'm seriously trying to figure out where do we check them in so other people can see them. Right. I mean, yep. yes, they're in my GitHub repo for GCE XFS tests or KVM XFS tests, but uh, I don't know. Should we be checking some of that into kernel documentation with a freshness state and just sort of that way other people can find it and it's all in one place? Yeah, uh, so should we put it somewhere else? And that might be an interesting thing to discuss. Just before we do that, could we rewind to, X to Linux Next? It will run XFS tests if you ask it and give it a config. So some of us are relying on Linux Next actually running that. So is your experience that their runs aren't reliable or you just haven't tried to ask them to run it on your train? Uh, so I think part of it is that Linux Next, uh, you, are you talking about the zero day test bot? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the zero day test bot only tests um, one configuration uh, and that's the one that's always clean. It's also the one that the vast majority of users use, which is the 4K block size. Um, mm. I have a whole bunch of other test configs like, you know, 1K block size, which is how I test PowerPC with the, you know, 4K block size, 16K page size um, config. Um, and that's where I have more of the flaky tests. Um, and, you know, if I worked for a company that made PowerPC machines, maybe I'd pr prioritize them more, um, but I don't. So I, you know, but the point is, is that that's where a lot of the flakes are. And Linux, the zero day um, bot is only testing one config out of like 12. So I'm should not we sure Intel more? would be willing to, you know, do all that extra testing. But uh, every test that is useful and uh, to Lewis's yeah. point is sort of not, intermittently failing, if we add it to Linux Next and it gives us a warning, it's one test we don't have to run. Is it useful to make more use of Linux Next for this? Uh, so I don't know what the communication path is to... You ask uh, Fangwag. Okay, yeah. I mean, I think the other thing is is that 
Uh, currently, we would need to make sure it understands things about like flaky tests, right? Because um, very often the zero day bot will pronounce something as a regression when it sees a test failure and it doesn't know necessarily that, oh, this is a flaky test. So it's not that this commit introduced the problem, it's just the zero day bot got unlucky, right? And so there's some work that we could do, but I, I certainly we could talk to Fengan about that. Yeah, I, I definitely want to move towards this this new reality where it is easy to tell what we expect to fail. Because I have no idea what we expect to fail on ext4. So if I make an ext4 change, I have to run it once, make the change, run it again. If I know what ext4 expects to fail, then I can just use their exclude script. Yeah. And you know, Liz does this with KDevOps, like he has the excludes scripts committed to the thing, which is likely what I'll do with ButterFS. But if we can do it, if we don't all want to use KDevOps, I'm okay with that. We can pick a, we can make a new repo or whatever, and we can give all of the maintainers and the core people commit access, and then we can just update our own exclude files as things change. And like then having those exclude files is really helpful for onboarding new engineers. Hey, go figure out why this test fails. Yeah, I, one of my wish list items, which I will probably do when I have time to do more XFS test hacking, is a mode where when a test fails, it will immediately run it 25 or 100 times so it can establish a failure percentage. Yeah. Um, and, that, and then what it can report is not only, you know, generic 382 failed, it failed 15% of the time. Right. right, because that's actually the useful bit of information. Um, I have information now that I periodically collect about failure percentages, and the problem is I don't want to auto exclude a test just because it's failing 15% of the time, because I know that if it's in the exclude file, I will stop worrying about it. Right, right? that's just human nature. Um, so I need, I actually want it in my face that, you know, this test is failing and I'll say, oh yeah, that's one of the tests that fail 10% of the time. I should really get to that one of the day, these days, right? But if we had a better way of encoding that information so that the test automatically established the flaky percentages and then that could be documented somewhere, that would probably serve both needs, right? Because there is the developer's requirements, which is I want to know where the bugs are and I want to actually get tickled to remember to fix them. And then there is the I'm a new developer and I want to know if my patch has caused things to have gotten worse. Right. Right. And for that, it yes, it absolutely makes sense to exclude, you know, auto exclude tests that even fail 2% of the time. Yeah. Because otherwise, it will stress out someone who is expecting all green tests. Right. Right. And and so we need to sort of answer both needs mm -hmm. um, in in some sort of solution that we we can like everyone is happy with. Okay. So so at so the I risk of getting into bike shedding about this, is there a reason that we can't just have this in the XFS or the FS test repo itself? Have the auto group be what a onboarding person can run and expect to pass 100 percent of the time? Have a Maintainer cares about this, but it's failing group. Yeah, so, well, and, so and but part of the problem is is that it's very config specific, right? So, um, so I, I think I, I I know an easy way that this could be done. Um, I think um, one of the ways would essentially just have um, uh, FS tests um, essentially just use a Git subtree that allows us to specify um, all these failures per kernel per configuration. And then you can have either a fast test or any test infrastructure, whether it's a TEDs, Minds, whatever, whoever's, can essentially just embrace that that Git tree as a Git subtree. And then whenever you want to update it, you simply just do it in one command. Now, if you're not familiar with Git subtrees, I just want to clarify that it's not a Git sub module. It's right. very, very, very different. It's pretty much like doing a merge commit locally. That's that's pretty much it. So then, I guess maybe it makes sense to in the same place where you have the, the ext4 config that you're running, have the exclude, exclu exclude list for that config. But then you're saying that it could also be kernel specific. It's kernel specific and it's also, you have to, conf you have to think about the fact that it's also uh, specific to the type of test environment that you're running, right? So like for instance, it'll fail, for instance, uh, the tests 
the failures that I have, for instance, will fail for sure if you're running, let's say, on a loopback device, right? Granted, yeah, this can also fail on a real um, type of uh, block device, right, if you're running the file system on that. It's just that it seems to that I'm using loopback devices, the failures happen a bit more often, that's all. Uh, but yes, you know, technically speaking, we are talking about configuration changes as well. And we have to think about also the fact that there's a kernel configuration aspect to this too, right? So I guess at some point we can stratify it so much that we can't, none of us can share it. So I think at some point we'd have to pick a, a common ground where we all say, okay, this fails on KDevOps, let's just add it to the global exclude list and uh, just so we can, for the sake of us all sharing this and just stick that in a Git repo like Joseph said. Yeah, and so like the other alternative to the exclude list things is what I did originally, which was have the running lists of, like have the nightly tests with what failed. And so that way I always knew, like I could click on a test and say, okay, this one's flaky, right? And so I knew when I ran my local tests, I could just check against what has been happening. And so this kind of gives us the best of both worlds, right? Yeah, um, I think the other thing is, is that if we want to do uh, promote interchange, uh, we will need to come to consensus on things like kernel configs and things like the names of the configs, right? So I have, you know, a whole bunch of configs, right? So I have things like ext4 slash 1k or xfs slash rtdev underscore logdev, right. right? That's one of Derek's ones. I came up with the name. And so if we want to be able to intelligently exchange include files, uh, exclude files, right, or, you know, whatever, we need to be able to know that we're both talking about the same file system type and configuration of that file system type. So I think right? this part is easier than you think it is because the, so what I do with my, my thing is like I have different hosts that are running, right? So the results are broken down by like username, host, configuration, name or whatever. So we can easily like structure the thing so much, like structure the Git tree. So it's like, okay, this is Ted's thing. And so all of Ted's stuff gets Ted's prefix. Is, okay, this is Ted underscore and then slash whatever your, you name the thing. So you can name it whatever arbitrary thing it is. And then one thing that we should probably add to XFS tests is an exclude list um, environmental variable that we can put in the sections and we can point at individual section exclude lists that per section for things that we expect to fail for those particular sections. Yeah, I mean, there are multiple ways we can sort of do that, right? I actually have multiple includes at different, exclude files at different levels. So I have like a global exclude list, a gl exclude list for all XFS tests, uh, for all XFS related configs, uh, and then uh, config specific exclude files, right? But the thing about, yeah, we could have a separate one for this is Ted's system, this is Louise's system. It doesn't help for someone who is, you know, coming at this new unless they're actually using our test runner, right? So, for example, for someone who wants to use my test runner, I actually have a test appliance, you know, it's a KVM rootfs image that's up on kernel.org. It actually has the exclude files built into the test appliance. And so therefore, if you're using, you know, my test appliance, you use my test configs and you use, um, you know, my exclude files and it's all one sort of turnkey thing. The part that gets a little bit tricky is if you're trying to do an XFS patch and you wanna use your test runner how do you map my config names into your test runner config? That's where we can either decide that, yeah, that's just a manual process, or we could try to see if we can try to automate that somehow. Right, and that's what I would like to do, is have a, a, a repo with a set way that we include these configuration, <coughs> this, these configs, and then it's just a matter of wiring it into KDevOps, your test harness, whatever. And then that way it is still turnkey. There is a centralized repo that we have a way to do. And then w whatever test appliance, whether it's a new one or the existing ones, they, they know that this repo looks a certain way and then can integrate it. Let, let's so think about this, like scaling this, right? Um, 
it seems like uh, having a tree where we can commit, you know, these sorts of uh, new failures, for instance, it, that seems like a welcome thing. Um, in terms of kernel, kernel, kernel configuration, I think it may be possible to at least streamline on a generic kernel configuration. I really do think yeah. that's possible. I, I, I can say that at least I have one kernel config that works on all cloud providers and also works with virtualization. So, and if you guys have any other changes that you guys wish to add, you know, send the patch. I have the, the, the kernel configs there present as well. So in that regards, I think we can start off trying to see if that works, just a simply, uh, you know, kernel release specific type of expunge list, right? Now, how do we scale this though, right? The next step would be, right, well, who's gonna send patches and who can commit to this repository? How often do you update? That sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah so uh, one thing I wanted to mention, I, I think it would be great for new people trying to run tests without, you know, knowledge of which ones are flaky or anything else. Like, if the test output had a way to say, this test is flaky 80% of the time or something like, so they don't have to go to Joseph's webpage and compare. Like, it's just right there in the test output. Right. You know, we're talking about putting this stuff into a Git repo somewhere. Like, that should be right in the test output. Um, yeah, well, th that's that's what happens, right? Is that um, you know, I'm all of these test runners have some sort of reporting system, uh, and the reporting system may just simply be you know just a straightforward translation of uh, XFS test output or the JUnit XML file. But we're essentially formatting that so that if you're using our test runner, the excludes automatically happen or whatnot or once we start adding flaky tests, you know, we can sort of put that there. But I think the assumption is that is something that the test runner does. Now, right. there's this interesting question for which we don't have all the right people in the room to have that conversation, which is what should be in the core XFS tests and what should be in the test runners and what maybe we'll have to factor out because the XFS test maintainer doesn't think that should be an XFS test, but Louise and I are both doing it, so maybe we can share code so that we're not reinventing the wheel. But there is a certain question of where should that functionality live, right? Well, <laughs> at, at some point, like, so now we're experimenting. Like, we're yeah. figuring out the best way to provide the best information to the people to increase velocity. But yeah. at some point, we'll have that dialed in pretty well, and then it'll be really obvious that it's time to pull that into the main XFS test. Yeah, so, so one of the things about the kernel config is I actually have a very standardized utility where, you know, I call it install-kconfig, and it sets up something that works for KVM and GCE. It'd be interesting to compare notes to see what you have for AWS and other cloud systems. But then the other thing that my install-kconfig has is I can give it command line options like dash dash lockdep, dash dash kasan, um, dash dash block tests, because block tests requires friggin' modules, um, and so I have a special install kconfig if I'm actually gonna be running block tests. Uh, and I think I have one or two others, but it's sort of like the standardized utility. We should compare notes, because maybe that's a utility that we just start to share. Now, how, whether that's a sub-module or we just manually keep it in sync, but that's probably something that we're both doing that is so similar that it, it's something that we can, you know, cooperate on. Yeah, the, the actual K config is a lot less interesting than the yeah. delta that makes that K config important. So turning on ButterFS debugging or turning on LockDep or config debug page alloc or whatever it is, like that delta is really small, and that's the important part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the and this is one of those interesting things, right? Which is I'm looking for repeatable results. And so having a standardized kconfig means that certain tests will either, you know, almost never happen or always fail, but I don't have to deal with kernel configs as being yet another variable, right? And so that may actually, that's one of those interesting things, right? Because you could argue that having everybody use a different set of kernel configs, maybe with some sort of randomization put in, finds more bugs. But I'm actually looking for something different, which is I want stability so that the bugs are reproducible, um, because that actually is one of the things I, act, uh, I ask people to do is I will tell them, you know, your patch is causing this to fail. If you use KVM XFS tests with these arguments, it will fail. And if you download this Git repo and whatnot, you can reproduce the failure I'm seeing. 
and that requires a stable kernel config. Um, and even if it's not the best kernel config for finding bugs, the fact that it is stable is actually more important for my use case, right? And, and that's actually, you know, again, that's part of the, what are the goals of testing? Um, are you trying to find all possible bugs or are you trying to reliably reproduce some set of bugs? <laughs> yeah. And so like, I, I think we're moving in the right direction here. I think the next thing that I want to talk about is just one thing, yeah, the ahead. thing that you mentioned, Chris, uh, that you wanted to have, I had already posted. Uh, the first version of the patch said that annotates tests with fixed by commit also had known issue on a fess. So you'd get the failure, but you get a hint knowing that somebody has already failed that on FS. I mean, you, yes, you can make it a little better with config and stuff, you can add the text for the hint, but that's the idea. I mean, that's wh exactly what you asked for. Yeah, and the real thing that people are trying to answer when they look at a failure is, are the maintainers going to care? Like, <laughs> I have failed this test, does it matter? Um, and knowing that someone else has failed it in the past is different from the maintainers know this is flaky and they don't actually care. So right now it's not up to merging because there was some objection, but if you're interested, we can bring that back. This is uh, really important. Uh, the last one of the last larger patch series that I s uh, that I sent, I created a Git repo where for all of the XFS test layouts that I had to run uh, the change for, uh, I posted the full output, and then uh, in the end posted the reason why I think each of the failures that was observed has nothing to do with the change that I posted. <laughs> which I was like, why do I have to do this? This cost yeah. me like two hours. Right. Exactly. And that's like. The, my, this, I think, standardizing on how we do this and how we run and making it easy for developers to reproduce and have a good answer leads me into my next thing, which is I don't want us to be running it ourselves on our own fucking hardware anymore. Like, we should all, or not all, this should be a service provided by, I don't know, perhaps the Linux Foundation or somebody <coughs> where that <coughs> we have this thing that runs consistently you know, perhaps just on on certain trees or whatever, but so that like, you know, I have four machines sitting at home that I've built to like do this in a variety of different ways. I want to throw all of those in the recycling bin and I don't want to have to maintain my own hardware. I'm sure, Ted, you don't want to, though I know you use GCE, so whatever. But like, that's the thing is like, I want everybody to just be on GC or AWS mm -hmm. or whatever. Similar for the like we do it for uh, K-Build, for example. K-Build uh, at some point started replying to trees that I push, saying yep. build succeeded. Same thing for XFS tests. Yeah, th this, this is what I want, is I want a community thing where we're all using the same stuff, and then we can do fancier things, like tie it into the Git trees. I can push a Git branch, and it just automatically gets tested, and I get an email <laughs> back saying, yeah, everything worked, good job. One of the things that might be helpful is if we actually spoke with one voice. Um, there is somewhere in kernel CI GitHub a, bugs, uh, a, a GitHub issue where I tried to explain this is what I need for kernel CI to be useful for me. Yeah. Right? There's a reason why I'm not using kernel CI. It doesn't meet my needs as a file system developer. Yeah. Um, and I actually tried to outline this is the feature request that I would like you to have. And, and I did this at last year's Plumbers. Um, and they said, thank you for your input, and I have never heard from them again. I, um, I think, but, you yeah, know. I mean, we have, to, we have to pitch in the labor, too, yeah, for, yeah. for whatever it is. And, right. and like, it's not all on you, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I think if we all sort of agreed, this is the thing that we would like Kernel CI to do, yeah. it would be great if there was a centralized dashboard that somebody else was running for which we could upload all of our test results and you know we can have the debate about should it be KTAP or should it be JUnit? Um, you know, you know, can you please upload all of our test artifacts? You know, all of the XFS tests. You know, dot out, dot full, dot bad, whatnot, into the test appliance. That's again one of the things Kernel CI doesn't do. If we could actually give them a feature request and they would actually implement it, that would be great because that way, even if we're all using our own test runners. Um, and sure, let's see if we can standardize that. 
I would love to get the dashboard standardized first. Yes. Because that way we can share each other's results. Uh, so one of the things is really, really missing here to have IRC channel. Because what happens every LSF, we have this topic. And we talk annually. And then things go missing. Whatever discussion we have, they don't go to where they're supposed to be. Or things just, they don't complete. So if we have IRC channel, then we can at least sync on a channel well, uh, and oh see what needs to be done logically in bi-monthly basis. Also, I mean, I that, that doesn't work with time zones. Uh, everybody's <laughs> not in the same time zone, so email is fine. Uh, yeah, Chat thing doesn't work for me, even within my team, so email, please. But I think the point about follow through is pretty valid, right? I mean. Yeah, so I haven't seen at least good follow-through happening over the email. Well, or things get like missing. That's my whole point. I, I have to say, I mean, like, I I knew that this was a problem, and at different as LSFMMs, this was I as as you're saying, this does come up. Uh, I'm still I still I haven't even presented here or talked about in, in details about KDOPS. I plan to talk about it in plumbers though, but I mean, I did some work. That shit took years. Let me tell you a lot of time. So, you know, I, I really tr do think that I put quite a bit of effort into the architecture behind it. And I'll just say this, the only reason why I didn't use TED stuff is just because I wanted to support mul multiple clouds, that's all. But, you know, in terms of uh, public expunge list, it's there. Do I update it regularly? Yes, pretty much as soon as I see a, a failure, it's there. Kernel configuration, it works on all cloud solutions, present. What else do you need? Yeah, I, and this is the thing, right, is I've been doing this by myself, Ted's been doing it by himself, and, you know, to be fair to Ted, I tried to use his stuff years ago, um, and it worked pretty well. It just didn't work for ButterFS at the time. Um, I, the reason I jumped on KDevOps was random. I actually don't remember why I did, but I, this is the thing, is, like, I can't sustain the development of my stuff and the development that I have to do in ButterFS. I need community support. And Lewis is doing the community support for the part that I don't want to do, which is making all the virtualization stuff work and make it all consistent and make sure it continues to work with all the different things. I want to give him the tools that he needs from me to do the same thing that I do at home. And I'm going to take his thing and I'm going to make it work in my system. And once we have it, his system works and my system works, that's two people that are using the same project and then we can grow it from there and I can get my other developers to use it and work out the kinks and once we've got all the kinks worked out and it's working consistently and we can collaborate on the exclude files and all that th all those things then it's a lot easier to go to Linux Foundation or somebody else and be like okay now take this off our hands or pay for us to use it in the cloud or whatever we already have sorry we already have this big project that we're all using let's get it integrated and let's get it working so the, the only thing I'll add to that is that the Linux Foundation isn't really set up to fund that. It's set up to right. channel funds from other people into a central place, right? So, right. you know, we'll just have to gather up between our companies the, the funding to make it happen. And th yeah. That's not hard. I also just wanted to throw out there, too, that I, I, I do think that Zero Day can likely do some of this, but the problem was the complexities around setting up a fast test. It, it, it's just a pain, and even for block tests, too, you know. So. To be fair, it was just really complex, and I know that certain file system developers, like James, you know, for instance, does S08 to enable a few tests, but they only run it once, and they only run it for a few series of tests. So I think that Zero Day could potentially, if they really wanted to, or if we wanted to, if they, we wanted to ask them, for instance, to consider using KDOPS just as a way to enable running file FS tests, I think it's possible there. That doesn't require much funding either. It's just telling them, hey, you know, just set this up, run a few make commands, and then just run the loop. The problem, though, is that as kind of like I had in my presentation, though, there's about 50% of the rest of the work, which is reporting the issues, right? Now, if we don't care about reporting the issues and we just want the expunges, then that's fine and easy, right? There's the whole lazy baseline thing. But actually collecting, as Ted uh, indicates, the artifacts, that's very valuable, right? Because that would be really beautiful to have uh, that will take a bit of resources, but uh, yeah, you know, may maybe maybe it doesn't require much funding. You know, I'm not sure really. Right. So, like, uh, my 
my plan is with KDevOps is to first of all get it working for my hardware and second of all tie it into my existing result thing because it's going to have to like I have my existing result thing it is terrible but it's something right and if we can be running on a bunch of stuff then we have we already I've already done the work to get the result stuff and then all it takes is the kernel CI guys to look at it and go and be appalled and horrified and be like you know what let's put this into kernel CI well and, and the thing is the funding is the easy part the hard part is the influence to do all the other stuff that we're talking about here yep. and to get all the file system people to go down the same path and agree on what's important and all that stuff. That's the hard part. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I think there are two hard parts, right? One is, uh, I've actually said this, which is if somebody wants kernel cl uh, Google Cloud credits, so they want to use GCE XFS tests, I'll give it to them if they're willing to commit to analyzing the test failure so that we actually have human annotated exclude files, because otherwise I can run the ButterFS test, I can run the F2FS test, I do that every so often. What I don't have time is to analyze the failures to understand what's going on with all the failures, right? That's what actually requires, you know, real, you know, file system engineering time to do, and, you know, if people want that, that, that actually is, I think, the critical short resource the other thing which I think might be helpful to do is to actually start thinking about maybe collaborating on some requirement documents because um, I've looked at KDevOps. One of the reasons why I'm continuing to do my system is there are certain critical things where I optimize KVM XFS tests for a file system developer, not as a quality control person, right? Not, not as quality assurance. Right, so for me, it is absolutely critical that I be able to run KVM XFS test shell. It plucks the kernel out of my build tree on my laptop that I have just built myself 15 seconds ago and pop up a QMU and then run the test and then see whether or not I can get things working or not, right? That is a very, very different requirement than something which is, you know, plucking kernels out of a git tree and building from the git tree. Yep. I added that later, but I have a whole set of requirements which are for my development workflow. And um, I think one of the critical systems is, it'd be great if we could um, standardize on one system. I've looked at KDevOps. It doesn't meet my needs as a file system developer, so I keep doing my own thing, right? And so, if we could somehow unify systems so that we were all using one system, or at least we can unify parts of the effort, like kernel config management, like exclude file management, like file system scenario testing, right? You know, different file system configs. That'd be great, right? I mean, let's see what we can unify at first, and then maybe we can eventually get to one system, but it may very well be that there will be one system that is really optimized for a local developer as opposed to something where you're just simply running a test spinner 100 times, 24 hours a day, and sure, that should be in a data center somewhere, yep. right, or a cloud VM somewhere. But, you know, the local file system developer experience is also important, I believe, for some file system developers. Yeah, so, uh, like, I, I totally agree, Ted, because, like, I have the same requirement, right? Like, I'd rather just build it on my local machine and do, and I use Vertme for this, right? Like I just yeah. build and run Vertme and it does my thing. And that's where I do my local testing. But I see that setup as separate from what I do with KDevOps. KDevOps is replacing my continual integration. What the, sorry, my daughter's. <laughs> anyway, um, God, she threw me off there. I see these as two separate things, right? And I think that if KDevOps could grow that ability to like just throw a random kernel in there, I would want So it, it, sh it should be possible to easily add that because, you know, again, one of the things that we're discussing a lot here is variability. And this is exactly why I ended up embracing kconfig. So this, this sh should just be a matter of adding a kconfig entry to say, hey, you know, instead of using this git tree, you know what? Here, use my local directory, use, you know, plan nine, and there you go. Uh, like and this is again why I have put effort into doing this because I know that like I will get it working for me and then I can wander off and you are going to keep it working 
and the community that we build around this stuff is going to continue working. Not that I'm not going to be, like I would continue to be the user and contributor, but like I will be able to put that in the back of my head, Lewis has got this covered, it's going to continue to work. And I can go back to focusing on what our plus development. So going back to Ted's idea on requirements documents, I think I'm totally on board with rallying behind anyone who's interested in making this their mission, yeah. right? And uh, you know, the next step is information from Lewis on what he needs from us, and we can write down what we need from him and, and take it from there. Yeah, I, you know, I think that Lewis and I have a good idea of what I need and like the the things that we need to add for for my setup, which is mostly just the PCI pass through and then there's other stuff that I've got to do but by and large like it works really well right so I, I, I will say this you know I use kdops also for my own kernel development <laughs> so the only thing is that I actually run my git trees within the gusts so es essentially w instead of having my development environment run in my home directory on my laptop I simply just SSH into the guest and that's where I do my development so, you know, yeah, no, I think this is a philosophical uh, difference, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, because for example, um, I got really valuable development because one of the ext4 developers runs XFS tests on a Raspberry Pi, and you don't build on a Raspberry Pi, oh, you no, just don't. I do, right? I build on a Raspberry <laughs> uh, Pi, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, and and so for me, one of the big things is that I don't build in the VMs because. You know, when I'm running KVM XFS tests on my laptop, I don't have a 48 CPU, you know, laptop. So I'm actually trying to conserve CPU, uh, and I actually build in my host system. I only run my tests in the VM. I don't build in the VM because it's just more efficient that way, right? And so that's a philosophical difference yeah, yeah, no, for because sure. I yes. want to be able to run tests on my laptop when I'm in an airplane, right? And that may not be important for some use use cases. <laughs> yeah, it should be possible to easily add support for that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think we've got a, a lot of good yeah. things. I think the biggest thing is kind of standardizing exclude lists and stuff, and then documentation. That's the other big thing with KDevOps is like I've spent a lot of time just trying to get it to work for me uh, because you use SLES and or you use Debian and I use Fedora, right? <laughs> And it's just more comfortable for me. Um, but I want to, you know, I think for me, it's going to be getting it to work for my, my setup, documenting it, and then we can start working on a communal exclude list setup and config setup and start integrating that. And then from there, we can start worrying about how we're going to run this for everybody automatically without us having to have our own hardware. All right. Perfect. Right on time. I think. In terms of next step, would it be perhaps useful to maybe start some threads on the FS tests mailing list? Um, I'm just sort of thinking about how can we take this forward, right? I think there are a bunch of things about like, you know, kernel configs, like exclude lists, and uh, that may be easier to do via email, and maybe that's a way that we can sort of continue that conversation as opposed to waiting until plumbers. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I, so in my head, and clearly I'm not very good at estimating times, but probably end of the month I have KDevOps doing, replacing my setup. Beginning of June I have email of, this is what I want to do, this is the, re the my idea for the repo, and this is all the documentation on how to run KDevOps, and from our setup, and this is what we've done, and then we can go from there. Because I, I definitely, by the time we all show up at Plumbers, I want at least most of this, I'm hoping that by Plumbers, I can run the stuff on AWS, whether or not somebody else is running it automatically is anybody's guess, but I want to have at least replaced my stuff and have consensus on where we find exclude lists and have some good documentation on how to run this stuff for different file systems. Uh, I can easily also just uh, put a repo that uh, is abstract to the runner, uh, and then we can just try to share something like that. I don't know if that's, th that should be easy. I could just send that to the mailing list, uh, if that's a next follow-up to, 
then what I can do is instead of using an expunge list that's specific to KDevOps, it's a public one that's agnostic to any runner, and that's it. Pretty much, it would just be, you know, public, and anyone can contribute to it. But again, there's questions about who can contribute to it. Um, you know, I think it may, may be just easy to enable all file system maintainers to be be able to push for that. And for developers, if they want to send a patch, I think that maybe uh, a reasonable justification might be to have also the artifacts somewhere, for instance. Yeah, I, I, I like like a, I like GitHub for this because it makes it easy. Like we just create a shared repo, add everybody's usernames, and they can just push for their config stuff. Because Lord knows we don't need more peop more maintainers for random Git trees. Let's just trust that we're all not idiots and push stuff. Yeah, again, we still need to uh, we still need to standardize uh, configs. I think yeah. you're not under uh, you may be underestimating how uh, mm -hmm. complex that may be because it looks like you've got essentially one default config for each of the file systems at this point mostly. Uh, uh, I think XFS is the one e e uh, counter example where you've got like 12 or something. Um, but like, you know, for me, I have a lot of exclude lists, which are, if you're using ext4 big alloc with clustered allocation, here's a bunch of excludes, right? If you're using a 1K block file system, here are a bunch of excludes. Sometimes they're test bugs, sometimes they are generic kernel bugs, right? But it's in fact, it's, it's not just, here are all the excludes for ext4, it's here are the excludes for all of these different file system yes, configs, uh, and we have to give, the, we have to agree on the names, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I actually think that, that that's not difficult because you already have the names, and you know, Joseph has his names, so I basically just picked those, and in the XFS community, I came up with those names, and I did collaborate with the XFS community on those names, so I think we're solid there. Uh, yeah. right, in terms we'll of see. the, in, in terms of the expunges, I do have them per section too, so they, they are very specific per section. When I see a failure in multiple sections, then basically there's an all.txt file that basically represents all, all the sections too. Yeah, I, I think it, you know this is easily solvable and probably the yeah. least complicated part of it. So. Yeah, well, we, we still need to document these are the mount options, these are the makefs options that correspond to each of the configs, right? So yeah, yeah we'll figure it out. I'm just saying there actually is a bunch of stuff there that's not, that, that does require some, some thought. 